Let me first introduce Alex Faker, who is the VP of Research and Development at Local Motors. Koji Gardner, who is a senior manager uh, of hardware engineering at Argo AI. And Jeff Stone, who is a software engineering manager at PACAR. Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining the discussion. So um, I love to drive, and um, every time I'm on a long road trip, my six-year-old at the back asks me the same question over and over again. I'm sure you guys have heard it. Are we there yet? And so I'll start by asking this question to each of you, um, and you can use that to describe the status of where you think your programs are. Uh, lots of interesting news on all, all these, from all these companies. So maybe I'll start with you, Alex. Are we there yet? <laughs> um, I I uh, I think that you know in a lot of ways the the uh, the setup for the question essentially is uh, are, are we there yet? Well, it, sometimes it gets very intimidating with uh, how much further we have to go. Yep. But um, I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, many of the topics, even just in, in some of the things that were brought up in the last panel, um, I, I think y you begin to discover that. Um, really paying a lot of attention to how you uh, modularize the value that, that the technology that we're bringing to bear can deliver uh, is kind of an important aspect of, of getting an answer to that question. And so I'd like to say, you know, yes, yes with some things and not with others, but uh, to have it not be a cop-out answer, I think that's the, the uh, I think that's really at the root of it because, um, you know, um, like when you talk about even just as ADAS is today, or, or you know, the example that was brought up just previously, if we can just get the vehicle to apply the brake, that will you know, do so much good. Well, that's a perfect example there where like, in a lot of ways, we already know how to get the vehicle to apply the brake. Cool, you know, done. Great, so modular, modular uh, uh, deployment of this technology is sort of how you see it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Koji? Yes, yeah, so I think this is a, an interesting question, and I think one of the things that was part of uh, the conversations earlier today is that I think as an industry, we're getting to the point where it's not so much how fast can we get there, and it's how do we set in place the metrics to know how far we've gotten and how much further we have to go. Uh, so to Alex's point, I think there is quite a ways to go. Um, speaking for you know, our company, I work for Argo AI. Uh, we partnered with Ford and most recently Volkswagen on deploying uh, self-driving vehicles at scale. Uh, and we have now vehicles running across the country in multiple different cities. So we're gathering tons of data. We're learning quite a bit about how uh, autonomous vehicles need to work in these different environments. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but we are you know, on a path. And I think the discussions that we've been having are, are healthy. It's not, are we going to be there next year? It's how far have we gotten? What are the challenges? How do we get past those? And Jeff, you come at this from an interesting perspective. You guys make trucks, right? So what are you doing do, in Silicon yeah. Valley? <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, what. What is PACCAR when I first joined PACCAR? I think everybody knows our t brands, our truck brands. So Peterbilt, Kenworth, and Doff in Europe are our brands. I would say if, as far as trucks goes, we are definitely not there yet. We have a number of partners that are doing self-driving trucks kind of in a prototype and limited use uh, case. Um, but uh, you know, trucking is serious. PACCAR takes safety very seriously. And uh, we won't let trucks onto the road until they're completely ready. Yeah. Great. So let's start uh, by talking a little bit more about safety. Um, so uh, there's many different aspects to safety. And I'll start maybe with you, uh, Koji, uh, on the sensor architecture, because that's near and dear to my heart. So, <laughs> so, let's, uh, so how, how do you guys approach designing a hardware sensor architecture, and maybe a broad, more broadly, a hardware architecture for really safe autonomous operation from the get-go? Sure. Uh, so this is a really great and important question. And for us, it starts with defining a word that many of you probably heard earlier today, which is the operational design domain. Uh, so what that means is those are the parameters under which uh, the vehicle is expected to drive autonomously. Uh, right now, we are not going to be developing cars that drive everywhere autonomously. They're going to be geofenced. And so the types of things that would go into the ODD are how fast are we expected to drive, what types of intersections are we going to be able to navigate? What types of road grades do we need to traverse? Uh, and those sorts of things have a huge impact on how you define the sensing architecture. 
Um, I think a great example of that is you know, the panel we have here. We're all working actually in very different ODDs. So for us, uh, we care about you know, driving in urban environments. So making an unprotected left turn across multiple lanes of traffic is very important. But for trucking, I would expect that's probably not as important as seeing very far on a freeway. Um, so those are examples that really lend themselves to how you define the sensing architecture. Um, the other thing to note is that defining a clear ODD really promotes safety in that you know exactly what the parameters are that you need to design the sensors to and how you need to validate them. Uh, once we do that, you can start looking at the different sensing, or the different sensing modalities. Uh, so we have, at a high level, cameras, which can give you, you know, high resolution color data. Uh, this is great for things like object detection, classification, traffic light detection. Uh, but cameras suffer in conditions where there's not enough illumination, for example. Uh, cameras also can't give you direct depth or range information. So that's where a sensor like LiDAR can complement cameras by giving you that direct depth information. Uh, and LiDAR also doesn't have the same ambient illumination problems. Uh, and then finally, you have radar, which uh, gives you direct range and velocity. So all these sensors together, they complement each other. It's, uh, you know, it's a sensing suite because there isn't just one sensor that can get you there. Uh, and I think developing that system with redundancy and the trade-offs between the advantages and disadvantages of those sensors in mind is really important to build a safe and robust system. Um, I'll add just one more thing, which is you know, an example that came out recently. Uh, many of you may have heard about BMW's uh, Vantablack coated vehicle that was announced a couple weeks ago. Uh, Vantablack, for those who aren't engineers, uh, is a coating that was developed for the science and engineering community for uh, its properties of absorbing light. It's very good for getting a very, very black surface. For optical sensors like LiDAR and camera, it's actually the worst possible thing. They rely on light bouncing off of objects. Uh, but as the radar engineers on my team have said, it's good job security for them. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is I think some, our LiDARs do see the Vanta black car. We did actually try that, but that's true. Yeah, it is. Great. So uh, uh, what about uh, you guys, Alex and uh, Jeff? You want to comment on how architectures, how do you start just from an architectural perspective, both software and hardware architectures, I guess, uh, to define a safe, uh, you know, a safe platform? I'm going to cue it to you because I agree with a lot of that <laughs> stuff. So, yeah. yeah, so for trucks, uh, there's some unique challenges. Um, you look at the cars driving around the, the valley, uh, LiDAR sensor located on top mostly. They have 360 degree view of the road, what's around them. Uh, trucks have a, a large object behind them, so it's hard to get a wrap around of what's behind you. So we have LiDAR sensors on both sides of the truck. That's a real challenge that uh, we have. Um, the trucks are up high, so we have to point the sensors differently than you would on a car. So the companies that have come to us and are trying to take their, uh, their passenger vehicle experience and put it onto a truck, there are challenges and we're working through those. Um, uh, one of the things that, again, uh, staying on the topic of safety, and uh, I've, we heard a lot of different answers to this question, but I would really be curious to hear what the panel thinks. Uh, one of the things that you hear a lot about is how safe is safe enough? At what point do you know that your system is ready for mass deployment? Uh, what are the metrics that you internally think about as an engineer or as an engineering leader when you, when you are ready to certify that this system is actually ready to get on the road? So, uh, I'll throw it open to the, to, the, to the panel. So what is the right metric for safety? Well, it's interesting because we were just, you know, talking before coming up here about the, the fact that ultimately, um, you know, at a certain point, even with the, the advances that, that um, you know, and, and definitely at, at our group, we've been working with uh, a number of research partners that have been working on different ways of, you know, uh, doing virtual validation, looking at edge cases, um, you know, creating uh, virtual scenarios that can uh, effectively, you know, automatically generate, um, the, you know, failure modes and things like that where you can vet your algorithms, your, your driving algorithms through them. And um, even in the face of all that uh, additional capability without actually, you know, getting out onto the road, um, you really don't begin to see those, those uh, you know, cases. Um, so obviously you have options that fall on from there in terms of t like that a lot of companies are taking and that, that you know, in, including us where, you know, for a period of time you're operating looking at, um, 
you know, look, basically running a twin and trying to understand where um, your systems are uh, failing during you know usual operation. But um, but it's uh, it's kind of a difficult thing to uh, it's a difficult thing to track. And I think that um, actually one of the ways in which you open the door for yourself is on on the flip side from all of the tech and all of the validation. Um, really being strategic with your uh, with your rollouts because um, even in as much as you can lump scenarios, every scenario is different, and so in a lot of ways, um, you know, every partner or customer that you pick in the early days is really um, your way of uh, you know you have to manage your environment so that you can put it into a context where you can start coming up with a real uh, a, a real threshold of we're now ready to operate. You have to like, you have to to kind of close your aperture enough and control it enough in the strategic customers that you pick um, to uh, kind of be conscientious to um, making sure that you're prepared to go operate. Yeah, I think the uh, the question of how do you get enough data about how actors in the real world, so vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, actually uh, act around a vehicle. Uh, there's really only a few ways to do that, and testing both in simulation as well as uh, in public roads allows you to gather that data. Um, I think a lot of people talk about autonomous driving as a, a long tail problem, meaning the first 99% of getting the vehicle to move and to detect uh, obvious objects, obey traffic laws, that's the easy part. The hard part is that last 1% of all the different cases that we deal with every day um, I think somebody mentioned earlier today, Colin from Ford, uh, you know, he knew that a car was going to cut off his son. Now, those are things we built over years of intuition driving, but you might not hit just by operating your vehicles uh, a small number of miles on the road. So one of the ways we're approaching this at Argo is we're taking the approach of deploying vehicles in multiple cities simultaneously. So we're driving around in Pittsburgh and Detroit, Palo Alto, uh, Miami, Washington, D.C., and recently Austin. And that allows us to learn a lot about different driving behaviors, driving cultures in different cities, uh, different traffic laws. Uh, really helps us to gain a robust understanding of how people operate in different road conditions. Uh, and that helps make the system as a whole more safe. So is it one of those things uh, which is like, you'll know it when you see it, which is kind of scary, because that means there isn't, there's a lack of standardization across the, across the spectrum on this idea of what, is, what the right safety metric is. So, are there any internal uh, opinions already in the in, within your engineering communities on uh, what a universal metric for safety looks like? Uh, and, and I'm sure it'll be different for trucks, by the way. Yeah, for, for trucks, it's it's a higher bar, I think. Uh, everyone that's operating a Class 8 truck has a CDL, which is a prof professional driver's license. Uh, you know, the, the bar for trucks is going to be higher. Uh, I have a 15-year-old son that just got his driver's license. The last panelist uh, said something about how 15-year-olds, uh, you want to give them a good introduction to dr driving and so forth. I tell my son, if you get on the freeway, follow a truck driver. They're the mm -hmm. safest, safest vehicles on, on the road. Um, so it's really important from that sense. It's a, it's a heavy vehicle. Uh, I think the bar for trucks is going to be quite high. So uh, the other aspect of this, of course, is scalability. Even though I think safety, I think we all agree, is the first hurdle that needs to be crossed. But at some point, getting on the road also means being able to do this in a commercially viable fashion. So, uh, and each of you come at this from a very different application. You know, trucks are different than shuttles are, you know, different than, uh, you know, managed fleets and robot taxis and so on. So. Uh, uh, I'll again throw the question open to the panel, is what needs to happen from an end system cost and scalability standpoint for you guys to be able to actually deploy in mass volume? Is it already there? Is the hardware, are the hardware, software, system costs already where they need to be? Or if not, where do they need to go? So I, I think th there's a couple pieces to this. Um, there's the commercial viability piece, uh, which I think for us, uh, you know, we're developing vehicles that will be used in fleets for things like transportation as a service. Uh, that changes the economics. We're not building vehicles to be sold to individuals. And so the price point can be at a point where the ROI for the fleet manager needs to make sense, but not so much for an individual. 
Uh, that said, all the sensors, the compute architecture, all of that costs a lot of money. So that is something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, I think the other part of that is, you know, automobiles need to be robust, they need to be reliable. Uh, and, you know, working in Silicon Valley, I can speak personally, I used to work in the consumer industry, and the standards for automobiles are incredibly different. Uh, these things need to be on the road uh, close to 24-7 if you're managing a fleet. Uh, they need to be operating in extreme weather conditions, uh, and that puts a heavy strain on the design of these sensor architectures. Uh, you know, automotive standards for temperature is minus 40 Celsius, uh, to 85, cel uh, 85 plus Celsius. So that's a huge range, and over that, things like optics uh, tend to suffer. So designing that in, uh, so you have robustness across the temperature range, across the lifetime, uh, that's a key hurdle we have to get over to get to scale. I think some of it has to do with, too, just the aspect of, um, that you know, we are, uh, we're putting so much more capability onto the vehicle um, in, you know, adding in all this hardware and compute associated with it. And, um, you know, again, this is sort of, a, this is a, a safety summit, so that's mm -hmm. sort of uh, a lot of the focus of it. But in a lot of ways, I think um, one of the things that, that makes it more difficult from an economic perspective is if you are still, um, if, if you're still sort of thinking of it, uh, thinking of the vehicle in the same role that it had previously, um, because then it, it basically has to fight against the, uh, the, you know, the solutions of the past, which were in some cases people, and I think that while uh, a lot of ground has been gained on that, I think that's still a very hard decision for, um, for even potential fleet owners, you know, and so um, a lot of the stuff that we've been thinking about is then, um, you know, be by virtue of all the technology that you're putting on there, rather than it just being that uh, you can take old metrics and uh, succeed at them to a higher degree. Um, basically, now if it's if something is you know uh, if you if you've now got a fleet that is uh, you know coordinated and controlled to the nth degree, and you have uh, you know access to all this now onboard vehicle uh, compute that you can leverage for other types of features or functions, then um, really the question becomes what other uh, what other uh, you know business models do you add on top of your fleets to where um, you know you're not just exchanging your fleet uh, to replace you know the the old fleet that your client had or to provide just we'll say a mobility solution for them but rather um, now that you have on one way or another won back their drive time for them or at least their population's drive time or logistical drive time um, you know what is that what other uh, value can the you then bring to bear if you've got a fleet that now can operate 24 hours versus having to staff multiple shifts and that being a, a barrier. Now, what can you do with the same fleet of vehicles in, you know, in the late shift versus the peak hour shifts? So multiple business models mm -hmm. uh, come into play to help the, with the economics. Uh, how does it work uh, in the trucking world? So luckily in trucking, uh, a lot of the fleets replace their trucks quite frequently, so that helps us in as rolling out new features, ADOS features, and ultimately autonomous vehicles. Um, some would say that trucking has a little bit less price sensitivity because the cost of the vehicle is a lot higher than just a passenger vehicle. So those are all economics that we're working through with our with our uh, with our fleets. That said, fleets uh, are businesses and they want to make uh, good profit, so they are cost sensitive. Um, some examples are uh, for every truck there's there's three trailers so they don't want a trailer sitting there in their yard with expensive sensors on it not being used mm -hmm. so those are some balances that we have to fi we have to figure out yeah. that makes sense uh, and I'm going to sort of take this arc and then take it to the future uh, because even though we are all engineers and we are grounded in data I'm actually going to go out and ask you a little bit about what you what you think is the future is going to look like and so each of you has a very different application, and so uh, you know, mass deployment means different things to each of you, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna put you on the spot just for a second. So in your own definition of mass deployment, when do you think we are actually gonna get there? I'm gonna ask for a number. <laughs> a range is okay, if you want. <laughs> hmm. um, I don't know, because certainly for us, since we're primarily focused on, uh, at the moment at least, on low-speed applications and um, really 
you know, campus environments, uh, you know, again, in a, in a large sense of the term. Um, you know, so we're looking for a very particular type of environment. Uh, you know, that, that would put, a, put, we'll say, put low speed in a situation where it might uh, take a little bit longer because you've got kind of a, a, you've got a very specific population or operational population you're going after. At the same time, um, you know, uh, especially when you start talking about how urban planning is evolving right now, in a lot of ways that market is coming up to meet the, uh, you know, the, the people like us where we are, um, you know, uh, we're specifically targeting a low speed market, market for multiple reasons, um, but at the same time that market is growing because of things like planned communities where people are kind of focusing, when they're looking at urban planning, they're focusing it inward within kind of islands of value, um, and there are a lot of communities being built around that model. Um, I could see it happening sooner rather than later. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, definitely in certain parts of the, the country and then the rest of the world. So um, I would expect around, uh, we'll say, 2023, you'd feel the real pulse of it. But I, as I say, it's already growing now, so. What do you think, Koji? So I think, you know, defining mass scale is a little difficult. <laughs> um, but I think we'll definitely begin to see the rollout of geofenced deployments of autonomous vehicles in the next handful of years. Um, th that's going to start happening. One hand. What's that? One hand. I, one hand, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, but these are going to be controlled ODDs. Um, they're not going to be driving all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things Alex mentioned, which I, I agree with, is part of that is going to be the uh, you know, synergy between tech companies and cities in terms of the types of infrastructure that's going to have to change. Uh, the types of education that has to happen with the communities to accept these. Uh, it's not just going to be an overnight sea change. It's going to be gradual, uh, but I think we'll start to see that shift happen in the next handful of years. What do you guys think? Yeah, for trucking, uh, you know, it's really a partnership with our, our customers and their drivers. Uh, we currently don't have fleets asking us for autonomous vehicles. Uh, they are asking for drivers. There's a huge shortage of commercial drivers in the U.S., uh, it's ballooning. I think last year there was a shortage of about 50,000 drivers in the U.S. Now it's 20% higher. In 2019, there's 60,000 uh, fewer drivers than we need for commercial driving. Uh, we have customers that say, I would buy 100 trucks if you can find me 100 drivers. So mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of putting a little pressure on, um, on the markets. Uh, I think we want to make the drivers... Uh, we want to roll out things that help drivers. It's a, it's a tough job. Uh, to the extent that we can make it easier to drive, I think it'll attract more younger folks to the profession. So that's how we're, we're going to roll things out for trucks, I think. Uh, fully autonomous, uh, there are some routes in the Southwest that are fully autonomous now with a safety driver. Uh, I think initial rollouts might be uh, dedicated lanes for trucks, where long haul routes can have dedicated lanes for the trucks. Uh, and there would be a commercial driver at each endpoint to uh, take over the driving back to the hub. Yeah. Nice. The good mm -hmm. news is we are hearing something between now to five years, which is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good to hear. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, I don't think people realize this, but I do think as an engineer, I think about this, and I think most engineers do think about this all the time, So, which is what is the impact to society uh, if your application is brilliantly successful, right? So. So for each of you, I'll ask the question, if you are brilliantly successful and you execute and you deploy in mass 10 years from now, in whatever space that you are deploying this technology, what change do you expect to see in society? Hopefully positive, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for us, it really is about, um, kind of related to my last comment, uh, for us, it really is going to be about um, so much up to this point, we look about transportation as this problem to solve, um, and really a lot of the work that gets done has been put towards, um, you know, minimizing the problem. And so you look at some of the groups that are sort of the most successful at this, and they're um, talking about, uh, you know, and, and you get basically logistical metrics about how much they've minimized it. It's kind of like, it's like a manufacturing problem where you're like, as soon as the need is there, you're already behind schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the best you're ever going to live, sort of, right? Or at least in, the, in certain models. And so it's sort of similar here where we always look at transportation as, as a problem when we're trying to 
to to uh, you know lessen that time, whether we're coordinating it better and uh, you know um, removing the time that people are in the vehicles. And I think for us, what it would be would be um, that we've gotten to a place where not only our understanding of utility has gotten um, uh, sort of advanced enough, but then also the culture has shifted enough to where people start looking at their uh, their time kind of in transport as just uh, as another sort of like very specific opportunity to um, address utility that they're trying to achieve in their day. Yeah, I think that was really uh, an eye opener for me. It, and this same team came out through multiple talks and it's really, we're not trying to solve for moving people from point A to point B, but actually to give people time back in their lives to do other things. It's really interesting. What, uh, what, what do you guys think? So I think the, the safety aspect of it, I definitely wanted to speak to in terms of having a vehicle that is always aware, it's not getting distracted, it can see and sense in all directions simultaneously. Uh, I think the you know, potential for that to reduce the number of uh, accidents, deaths that we have year to year is, is going to have a huge impact on society. Uh, beyond that, giving accessibility to folks who don't have it today, so that personal mobility aspect uh, we think a lot about. And then looking kind of further into the future, uh, the types of things this will open up in cities, for example, I think Dr. Burns was talking about you know, how much space is used for parking spaces today in urban centers. Having that go away because we have autonomous vehicles that can you know, shuttle people around and not personal vehicles that are parked everywhere. I think that'll have a huge uh, impact on society in, in the future. Not in the next handful of years, <laughs> but in the future. Jeff? <laughs> I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, if you, are, if you are successful in deploying your technologies that you're working on, 10 years from now, what positive impact do you think you will have on society? Obviously, you already started talking about it with, with drivers and with uh, uh, helping drivers actually achieve higher productivity and safety. So, uh, I think truck driving is a, a tough job, right? So to the extent that we can relieve the pressure on some very dedicated, uh, long-range hauling situations is a huge thing. Uh, giving truck drivers their, their lives back they would live closer to home, potentially be able to see their kids, and they're finishing the, the long, the last uh, mile, so forth and so forth, in a longer haul. I think that's a huge benefit to that profession that we can we can offer. Right. Yeah. I think we can throw it open to the audience if yeah. you have some time. If anyone has any questions, let's see a uh, show of hands here. Right over here, it's coming right to you. Go ahead, try now. Well, that didn't work. Mic on? Is the mic on? Sorry. No, it should be automatic. There you go. Yeah, thank you for this uh, great panel. In terms of functional safety, I like to break it into uh, kind of uh, two things. One for level one, two, or 2.5, or premium uh, level two. There's still the functional safety standard ISO 26262, which is broadly used in this in the industry today. And there is level three, four, and five where there'll be massive AI machine learning, where it's still. Uh, so I, I come from an aerospace, the aerospace industry, where we certified dozens of uh, airborne software, and we're using this ex expertise to accelerate functional safety for uh, automotive for for level two, two point five. But for level four or five, it's still a big question mark, especially that there's going to be a lot of embedded AI into these cars, and how can we certify something today that we keep learning, and how can we make sure it's safe? So we're investing into some R&D project to find a way into this, this certification, but I'd be curious to, uh, to know what, uh, what you guys uh, uh, think about that, or what are your, uh, your opinions uh, about this trend? Thank you. Functional safety for AI. So, so I think the functional safety question, it, it spans you know, end to end in the system, right? So we have to look at everything from where the data comes in on the sensing end and the hardware there uh, through the AI to the motion controls. And you're right that the AI portion of that is challenging. How do you define what is safe in terms of a machine learning algorithm? Uh, there are things that 
you know, you can do to build in redundancies that perhaps use a, uh, for lack of a better term, less uh, machine learning type approach, for example, a more traditional computer vision approach that would uh, be more amenable to functional safety standards for software. Uh, so building in redundancies, different paths that allow you to check that each step along the way is safe, uh, that's one of the core ways that we approach um, this. I also think, you know, really, uh, as much as you, as much as we're looking for ways that um, we can allow our capabilities to more dynamically uh, grow, sort of, um, you know, uh, in and of themselves, and sort of uh, uh, continue to to develop based off of the experience that we're gaining in kind of exponential terms. I think the rollout strategy for what you you know what you uncover with that work is also something that can be heavily managed and uh, and also uh, managed in, in a bit more of a traditional way and although um, y you know although we're certainly very excited with um, you know if, if you know how to do something better than allowing yourself allowing you to, to uh, take advantage of that as soon as possible is, is um, something that uh, you know, especially in things like our manufacturing method we really promote. At the same time, I, I would definitely agree that uh, while the learnings can come in um, sort of at, at that fast of a pace, it doesn't mean that, um, that you, uh, doesn't mean that you can't kind of regulate the, the rollout of those things and put them through a standardized, uh, a standardized process of, of validation and then piloting um, in the same way as you would have um, something that wasn't maybe so organic. Okay, and we have room, uh, time for just one more question right here. Hi, my name is Anand. Uh, maybe a question for the panelists. What hardware and software technologies you want, you, you would like to see as technologists for your respective organizations that could help accelerate uh, the move to autonomy? I'd like to see cheaper lasers. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have people you can talk to. <laughs> yeah. So, so just so I, I'm, I got the question. You're saying uh, what hardware and software uh, would I like to see to uh, accelerate? To, yeah, to accelerate it. Accelerate your deployment or accelerate your. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that um, in a lot of ways the. Uh, you know, we focus a lot on kind of the, uh, we, we, in a lot of cases, there's still a lot of focus on kind of hardware and software at the vehicle scale. Um, but I think one of the, uh, again, the attributes to, or one of the aspects to really unlocking the, the value of the fleets, which then, um, which again, in a lot of our cases, um, you, you know, as we go into autonomous vehicles, there's more and more of an emphasis on um, on sort of a fleet model uh, rather than just private ownership um, because in a lot of ways the reasons why um, we would be doing or, or why we would be de-emphasizing private ownership are um, kind of hand in hand to why we're also attracted to uh, automation. Um, you know, so I think because of that, a lot of the ways uh, that we're looking to kind of unlock um, the value of those fleets such that they become feasible uh, to kind of get on the road and for um, potential clients to buy into. I think the uh, getting uh, more and more advances in sort of fleet management and how, how those fleets are managed and then uh, how they're uh, managed for service or for usage or um, how their uh, use cases can be made more dynamic, that's really um, one of the areas where I think it feels like, in some cases, it's kind of on the on the periphery, but in a lot of ways, it's uh, it's going to open the door, um, or we'll say, act as, as act as a bridge because it's tied in so closely to the economics of those fleets succeeding. Okay. Anything else to close us out? No. Gentlemen, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for sharing. Really appreciate it.